So yeah, thanks for coming out for this update on our work on disease resistance in maize. This, uh, this shows a star of this, uh, this presentation, northern leaf blight infecting a corn plant in an African cornfield, and that's what it looks like under the microscope. And these are the two people whose work I'm mainly featuring today, uh, Tiffany Jaman and Judy Kolkman, who've been working on, on northern leaf blight in my lab. So, ooh, hmm. is that a problem? Okay, uh, so uh, we work on a, a series of pathosystems of maize. So uh, northern leaf blight, gray leaf spot, and common rust are fungal diseases, and Stewart's wilt. Uh, is there a generation? Uh, St Stewart's wilt there is a bacterial disease. Uh, shoot, so those are foliar diseases. Um, in green there, we, uh, we work a little bit on anthracnose stalk rot and quite a bit on a couple of ear rot diseases that cause mycotoxins to accumulate um, in, in uh, many of the maize-based food systems around the world. But today I'll be focusing on that northern leaf blight system. Uh, it's a fungal disease caused by Cetisferia tersica. And, and that bottom panel shows the disease progression from little, little flecks through to large uh, wilted lesions. Um, yesterday, Gary Bergstrom gave us a uh, talk to the plant pathology faculty, and he pointed out that this disease is um, quite epidemic in the United States lately. So inheritance of resistance in northern leaf blight comes in two main flavors. You have uh, qualitative resistance conditioned by a couple of major genes, segregating 3 to 1 in an F2, and then quantitative uh, resistance uh, with complex inheritance that's conditioned by multiple genes of small effect. So we tend to call this, you know, there's a lot of nomenclature for this, this dichotomy, which is somewhat of a false dichotomy, but you know, the simple resistance, simple inheritance, and complex resistance. And if you'll indulge me, I'll just uh, philosophize about simplicity and complexity for a couple of slides. Um, this slide here, I'm trying to point out that people love simple solutions. And no wonder, you know, health in the form of an antibiotic or a vitamin is a powerful phenomenon, you know, security. There's more to security than a bullet, but it goes a long way. There's a lot of, you know, you've got a green revolution based on seed and fertilizer and, and, and you know, plus plus. Um, and he, with disease resistance, we also have this uh, simple forms of resistance, simply inherited, well understood forms of resistance um, that, you know, have been quite well, well analyzed by now. But particularly with the genomics era, and also just in any field, we recognize that the simple, simple solutions are always embedded in very complex realities. So, um, you know, we recognize that, that things, you know, you, once you start doing, looking at a genomical viewpoint, it's almost horrifically complicated. So systems have their history, their uh, regulatory elements, they have complex behavior based on multifunctionality, uh, and you know, different elements have different trade-offs. You know, I have the same peptides operating in my brain and my gut doing very, very different things. Um, sometimes the, the, the system's architecture can give you robustness and resilience, and sometimes they give you unexpected perturbations or tipping points. So complex behavior from complex systems. So in that, uh, that with that excuse, I'll uh, undertake to tell you about our work on quantitative disease resistance. I've been interested in the complex resistance for years because the systems that I've always worked on um, don't have reliable forms of simple resistance. The simple resistance breaks down in agricultural practice or doesn't exist. So attractive as it may be, it does not have a good performance record in the pathosystems that I've worked on in rice, potato, and maize. So this shows the, um, the range of disease phenotypes in the founders of the nested association mapping platform that we, we've benefited greatly from that the Buckler organization has come up with and company. So in, in trying to understand resistance, we tap into a range of resources, starting with biparental QTL maps and synthesizing them, sometimes uh, analyzing them together in meta-analysis. We've benefited greatly, as I mentioned, from the, pla the maze platform that the um, maize diversity project led by Ed Buckler has come up with, including nested association mapping, a multi-parental population I think many of you know much about, um, various diversity panels that allow us to do um, genome-wide association. We've also used fine mapping and isogenic uh, materials of various derivations, mutants, and we're starting to look at expression and just beginning to uh, get some of our genes starting through a transgenic pipeline as well. Uh, so when we started a few years ago, um, what we had, uh, the picture was a, a series of 
biparental mapping populations had been analyzed for northern leaf blight. So this is Randy Weiser, if you've been around for a while. He was my first grad student here. He summarized the different QTL studies for northern leaf blight thusly. And so our, then we, we sort of undertook the project of trying to relate that picture, that genetic picture, to the, uh, the emerging molecular um, understanding of this trait of disease resistance that's coming out of a great deal of work um, in Arabidopsis and many, many systems. So trying to figure out how these different low, how these different, uh, this different, this machinery, this system of, uh, of resistance maps onto those, that genetic architecture. Um, and thinking about that, we've, we came up with a few years ago a set of hypotheses about how quantitative resistance might operate. And they range from, um, from morphological possibilities evol you know, involved in avoiding disease, perception, signaling, and response, you know, basal resistance, weak forms of, of major genes, defense and response, chemical warfare, previously unknown traits. So we have sort of an, a, a real hypothesis of that all of the above, that quantitative resistance involves a, a, a diversity of mechanisms, um, of a diversity of types, and that raises the question, so you know, I wanted to present to you today what we've been learning about it, and raise the question of what sorts of pleiotropies might be implicated in that. So if you're using a uh, um, bespoke system of you know, per se resistance, it can maybe be uh, without too many downsides. It may or may not work, but it may, may come with few downsides. But if you're going to be having a morphological or developmental approach, this could have impact on yield and other important traits. So when I think about pleiotropies, there's sort of three categories I want to raise. One is when a resistance to a disease affects yield, you know, a developmental mechanism might do so. When resistance to a certain disease might affect response to other diseases, and there are cases when you know, resistance to one disease is associated with susceptibility to another or resistance to another. So it's an old chestnut of ours, this issue of multiple disease resistance, because it would be such a yummy idea. And then just the, the broader general case of when disease affects any other trait. So I'll be reporting on those sorts of pleiotropies that we see emerging um, lately in our system. And here, just showing some, an ancient picture from Back in the day when people, when people were still in the simplicity picture, you know, take a, a phenylalanine ammonium lyase, a, a nice defense gene, you think you can make a, a resistant plant if we put that in. You know, and instead you get a cabbage you know, out of your, you know, so, so these issues of trade-offs have been, have been apparent for a while. So the first pleiotropy I want to uh, acknowledge is the one of between disease resistance, area under disease progress curve, and maturity days to anthesis. And so this is from Judy's work, Judy Cookman's work on the 282 diversity panel. So when she phenotyped that three years in the field, she sees a very strong correlation between maturity and disease. And so we see this for all of our diseases. And in this panel, our diseases show correlated responses to each other. So it looks like there's this huge set of pleiotropies. Um, and that picture broke down considerably when Jesse Poland uh, broke up the population structure that was there in the 282 diversity panel looking, so this is his map at, at, from the nested association mapping panel looking at southern, southern corn leaf blight, those were the results coming from Peter Ballant Curdy's lab in North Carolina, um, northern leaf blight and gray leaf spot was done by Jackie, um, Jackie Benson in my lab, so she, I, 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 I'm not gonna talk about Jackie's work today because she will be talking about it shortly in this, in this room, I hope. Um, uh, okay, so you know, is it is it complex or is it messy? You know, J Jesse commented on the pleiotropic interactions that he could detect at this level, complex and messy. I would have to say. So rather than go further into the interactions among these traits at this <coughs> level, I wanted today to go um, look at uh, specific loci. So so zoom in on particular loci and see what we see there. So this is. Um, Jesse's map of the nested association, you know, based on the nested association mapping uh, a population. And these are, you know, this is chromosome one through eight, just got cut off there. Um, so the black bars are the quantitative trait loci that uh, Jesse was able to identify using linkage, the linkage, so li linkage mapping within this population. And then the bubbles, it's blue if it's from the, one, from the common parent and red if it's from the other parent in this multi-parental population. And the, the size of the bubble reflects the strength of the, of the QTL effect. And the height reflects the Bayesian posterior probability. 
So the likelihood that there's a QTL at that particular single nucleotide polymorphism. So, so that's sort of the overview look of Jesse's map. And what I'd like to do today is go through a series of loci. One, um, and and when, I, when I have 102 here, I'm referring to this old school uh, bin of maze, so the second bin on chromosome one. So bear with me, I'm old school, you know. So all, they all, each of these, it's like, a, these are like personalities, you know, and I know them by their bin. So, so bin 102, there's a QTL there. Note that it's not, neither a QTL nor a, nor a SNP of interest associated. 106, uh, 103, and then two loci that are associated with this biggest uh, QTL here. So I'm just going to go through each of these cases in that order and show you what we've, we've, we've learned about the, the issues. So just a note here is that when Jesse looked at these um, QTL, he, show, showed, he saw very small allele effects ranging from plus to minus 3% of the disease leaf area. Whereas uh, when we look in, in near isogenic lines or in mutants, we're seeing substantially bigger effects. 18 to 38, 10 percent, 5 to 10 percent. So, so they're, they are, they turn out to be a more, bit more tractable as individual also than I would have expected. So keep that question in mind. Are there major QTL in maize? Sort of looks like it at the QTL level. Okay, so starting with these two that I mentioned first, 102 and 106. So uh, Chung and Chung had discovered these by looking at an introgression library in which segments of the text 303 Gene, uh, genome are introgressed into B73. So she found that, um, so that's B73. If she took out the B73 allele at uh, bin 102, she got a much more susceptible plant. And if she took out the B73 and put in text at 106, she got a more resistant plant. So you see that if that's B73's disease progress, disease leaf area over time. So B73 is like this. You, you, Add in the 106 locus from TEX and you get a more resistant plant, slower disease progress. Add the TEX 303 allele at 102 and you get a much more susceptible plant. You know, very dramatic effects. Uh, so she characterized them under the microscope and she saw that they had different um, microscopic phenotypes. So these are the different stages in pathogenesis. And she saw that the 106 QTL, the one with a slightly less effect, um, affected the early stages of pathogenesis, whereas the, the one with the bigger susceptibility effect affected the later stages of pathogenesis, the invasion of the vasculature. So these are different loci with different developmental effects on the pathogenesis process. So looking at this BIN 102 effect, so affecting that vascular invasion here, so it delays disease by two or three days, has a big effect on disease, and has this interesting property that I mentioned of multi conditioning multiple disease resistance. Northern leaf blight rust and Stewart's wilt. And um, based on one year of, of measurements, also flowering time. So you know, it's a big effect that we have no problem seeing in the field, in the isolines. And again, I mentioned um, it affects not only northern leaf blight, but also common rust and Stewart's wilt shown here. So the TEX-303 gives, allele gives susceptibility to the, all three of those diseases. Um, so when Tiffany inoculated uh, the, the isolines with uh, four diverse races that, ref that represents the different pathotypes or races, um, four different isolates representing these, these different races, she was able to demonstrate that this resistance is race nonspecific, at least with respect to those four isolates representing those four races. And so she started fine mapping the locus. Now, um, from the nested association mapping, there was an uh, association hit at a serine carboxypeptidase gene here. And then there's a, from the a diversity panel, there was an association with this gene called RIC here. So then uh, a couple of years ago from her field season, Tiffany was able to then reduce the fine mapping interval to the 3.4 megabase area, which eliminated the serine carboxypeptidase from candidacy. Um, and leaving RIC like right under the peak for northern leaf blight, the northern leaf blight effect and for the Stewart's wilt effect. So this is the position along the chromosome, and that's the statistical likelihood that there's the, the QTL is located there. So note that she's been able to disconnect the rust QTL at this point 
from the QTL for Stewart's Wilt and Northern Leaf Blight. So we got really excited about the RIC gene. Uh, mm -hmm. She did some more association work, sequencing out of the uh, 282 line diversity panel, and was able to find um, some single nucleotides that were associated with uh, resistance and polymorphic in the germplasm of, of interest to her. She was also able to show that the gene was induced by inoculation with the pathogen and digging into the literature that it had a credible role in the defense process. So we were really jazzed that this could be it. Um, but um, <laughs> she had a failed season the year before last. And then this last summer, she was pretty decisively able to eliminate Rick from the fine mapping interval. So, so frustration. Um, and just note, the f just note the way that, that she loses phenotype as she, as she continues to reduce the interval. And there is a clear peak here uh, with those four, with those uh, three recombinants, those two recombinants breaking up. And so she was able to um, delineate now the QTL down to a 16.6 a <laughs> kilobase region that features four genes, one of which you know, is her favorite so far, but once again, we're you know, so close and yet not able to swear which gene, if there is one gene that's involved. So just to summarize the findings so far at this locus, um, this is Judy's results with the diversity panel showing these are the, um, the association hits. This is the fine mapping interval and the original introgression. And so these are all statistical inferences based on the near, uh, nested association mapping. So this is the, the joint linkage mapping interval where the, you know, if you look across the 26 populations, uh, this was the interval that was implicated in this QTL. It does not overlap, no, with the introgression that seems to be associated with resistance. And that's presumably because this is really a, a rare bad allele. It's text 303 has a rare bad allele. <coughs> So it's not a, a, a nicely balanced good allele. So I think that the NAM uh, inference seems to be based on this QTL over here. So it seems like there might be a lot going on in the region, and it's hard to pick up that rare battle allele using the, the NAM inference. But by fine mapping, you know, that's the location. So um, a bit complex there. Um, so rare battle allele, um, and it's really been the we've we we had. Um, no NAM QTL at that region, no NAM GWAS hits. Uh, we had a diversity panel, a panel hit, but again, it was el eliminated. And it's really, you know, we've, uh, working on the RIC, we couldn't even get seeds of the mutant. So it's really the, been the fine mapping that's allowed us to get as far as this with this particular locus. So moving on to 106, where we actually have um, a, a, G, a locus that corresponds with a NAM QTL locus and some association hits. Again, this locus conditions resistance to multiple diseases. Uh, in this case, two northern leaf blight and Stewart's wilt. It's a more modest effect, but that effect is associated with the TEX303 allele. Oh, sorry. Um, it is that earlier stage in pathogenesis that's influenced by this particular gene. So in this case, um, as of a couple of years ago, Tiffany had reduced the interval here to um, just under six megabases. And there was, um, there was a gene that had come out um, from conversations Judy was having at the Mays meeting with a, with a developmental biologist, a cell, cell biologist, who was interested in a gene that, that happens to be right at that place. So um, that gene is called PAN1 for pangloss. So it's an LRR um, RLK gene that doesn't have kinase um, activity. Um, its, its developmental role seems to be something to do with, I mean, it's known for having an effect on stomatal development. The stomatal subsidiary cells now come out about 20% misshapen in the mutants here. And there's, there's a, it, the pan gene operates with this other gene called BRIC in activating um, actin complexes. So I think it's something to do with the you know, developmental architecture of the plant um, that's involved with this pan gene. So uh, we've done quite a bit of inoculation work with our lab and also um, Gillian Turgeon's upstairs and Peter Ballant-Curdy's lab 
in North Carolina. And I'll summarize those results here. So this is from Tiffany and Judy's work. They got three field tests here um, comparing B73 with these two PAN1 mutants. You get um, about half as much disease in the mutants. So the mutants are more resistant here. That was a surprise, because the reason that Lori Smith, who's the, the cell biologist, had asked us to do the inoculations, she thought the mutants might be resistant, but in fact, um, oh, sorry, might be more susceptible, but in fact, they're considerably more resistant here. The same, the same findings were uh, validated in, in greenhouse assays by Gillian Turgeon's group. Um, not only is the, are the plants with a mutation more resistant to northern leaf blight? They're also more resistant and dramatically more resistant to Stewart's wilt, that bacterial vascular pathogen. So we've got a fungal vascular pathogen that's resistant in the mutant and also a bacterial vascular pathogen that's resistant in the mutant, which is actually how, remember the, how the QTL behaves. So the pan mutants much more, almost tenfold more resistant. And this is from another group, again showing that the pan mutants are very, very resistant while their wild type appropriate controls are, are much more susceptible. Um, interestingly, rust looks like it's not more resistant, but rather more susceptible in the pan mutants. So uh, here you have B73 and the pan, the pan mutants being more susceptible to rust. So to summarize the story here, um, the, at the level of the nested association mapping, these are the, sorry if I haven't explained this well so far, these blue bars are the individual subpopulation maps. And then this is the summary of, of these maps by joint linkage. So here we have our, these are two different introgressions for this particular locus and the fine mapping interval. And they all line up in this case quite well. So you have the different subpopulation maps here those coalesce into the nested association, nested, I mean, the joint linkage map, which corresponds nicely to the introgressions of interest here. Um, so we have you know, a, a nice looking um, association hit here, right above that. That's a copy number variation uh, uh, polymorphism. Uh, so this story looks a bit cleaner in terms of the, in terms of the, um, <laughs> the way the mapping worked out. So now to, to, to zoom in there on that, that introgression. So this is that small area. And you can see again that, I mean, looking at that particular interval, Tiffany's um, last uh, cycle of fine mapping has resulted in this plateau, like it's not a clear peak like the other locusts, but rather a, quite a flat plateau there. And if you look at the way that the phenotype decreases with recombinants, it's gradualistic. So whereas if you had a, a certain <laughs> locus that was responsible, and then the breakpoint analysis you'd think would give you sort of a cleaner, you know, you'd get uh, susceptible, 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 and then resistant when you hit the text. But it, it doesn't, it's not behaving that way. Um, and, and the pan locus is not very central on that, on that plateau. So if the pan locus were actually causing this this phenotype you'd expect it to be somewhere in here, but it's way over here on the edge. So once again, it looks like our favorite candidate, although extremely attractive based on the mutant analysis, is maybe not explaining this phenotypic distribution. Although it could be explaining some of it. So um, just a couple of days ago, we were chatting with uh, Ed Buckler and uh, we requested that Dallas please let us know what are the genes, what are the other associations that are found within that interval that we've implicated for northern leaf blight. And um, so Dallas on, you know, on negative time notice was kind enough to, to look at his database on different associations that other groups have found for that particular interval. And I don't know if you can see it really, but there's a, quite a lot of association with other traits. So further to this issue of pleiotropy, I'm concerned about this issue of pleiotropy because I don't want to innocently recommend, oh, we've got this great resistance locus and it has some horrible effect on you know, yield or whatever. And in fact, there are a lot of other traits um, that are, that, where there's some phenotypic um, value that's associated with this region. So I just want to uh, highlight a couple of things. This is the pan locus here, and it's associated not only with northern leaf blight, 
uh, sorry. This is actually, sorry, <laughs> it's confusing. That's blue and that's purple. So this, this association was, is with gray leaf spot. So that's with Jackie's data set and southern leaf blight. So the PAN1 phenotypically, we actually didn't see mutant phenotypes for either one of these diseases, but we do see association results. So whereas we do see a mutant phenotype for northern leaf blight, there is no northern leaf blight association in these data sets. I don't know, I, I can't understand it. There are three uh, northern leaf blight associations here at the end of this interval, and there's all sorts of great traits, the leaf width, um, nodes, you know, stasis silky and chlorophyll B. Uh, this big one here is glutamate. So I think I, I won't attempt an interpretation here, but I think we have a lot of work to do to understand how the pleiotropies, how the different genetic effects at this locus play out and what other traits really are directly related, what, what are cases of linkage versus genes that have multiple effects on multiple phenotypes here and what that might mean for crop improvement. Um, is, you know, I'm really curious to know. I don't want to recommend, oh, this is great resistance locus and whatever ha is happening with glutamate is catastrophic for whatever reason. Okay, so uh, right in this particular cluster of associations, there are a whole set of uh, 28 genes, so they're going to be particular targets of, um, of interest for us. Okay, so uh, just to sum up here, the 106 story, um, we started with an introgression map and through near isogenic lines and histopathology have come to appreciate that this is a gene that's involved in early state resistance to early stage of pathogenesis. The um, NAM GWAS and NAM QTL have given us some, uh, a bunch of candidates to look at here. Um, and uh, we'll be, Tiffany ordered mutant, mutant lines for each of these. And the pan mutant's been a really interesting story, but perplexing because it doesn't seem to be as central to the, to the interval as we would have hoped. So now onto the tassel seed story. So this is Judy Kochman's work. Um, it's nice that uh, the, the mutant phenotype here was discovered by our very own Emerson um, of, of Emerson Hall. I'm sure there's not, it's not, he would not appreciate that uh, description. But so these are, uh, <laughs> um, so a couple of genes that, that uh, they, in Judy's work they have a, uh, the, some reasonable effect on disease development and, and uh, both in terms of delay and in terms of disease leaf area. So these, um, when Randy Weiser, uh, okay, Judy had obtained three years of association results for the 282 line association panel. And the very first SNP data set to come out of the uh, maize diversity project, 4,000 SNPs, and we got, we were lucky enough to get three positive you know, associations with disease from, from that first uh, set of SNPs. And one of them was this glutathione S transferase gene that, that Randy has published on. And then the, the other one of interest to us was this tassel seed 2 locus. And, you know, what's not to like about that phenotype? Judy was enchanted with it and has been working with it a lot since then. So she did, she did some sequencing of the gene out of that association panel and got a um, non synonymous uh, polymorphism there. Um, and so she, was, she figured she was onto something, did some looking into what is this, what is this a gene, what are these genes and what would it mean? So if you knock out the tassel seed genes, you get this feminization of the tassel. So instead of getting male gametes, you're getting seeds growing on the tassel you know, at the top of the plant. So tassel seed two, the one that was associated with resistance, is a, a short chain dehydrogenase reductase. So in that feminization, in, in, I mean, in, in normal pollen, pollen development, that tassel seed 2 gene is involved in the cell death process. And, and often defense-related genes are involved in cell death. There is an Arabidopsis short-chain dehydrogenase reductase that has been implicated in multiple disease resistance, so that's encouraging. Tassel seed, uh, so, oh, sorry, that's a mistake. Tassel seed 1 is actually a lipox lipoxygenase gene that's involved in synthesizing jasmonic acid. And jasmonic acid has quite a good, strong pedigree in terms of being um, definitely in, in, you know, implicated in defense. Mutants in jasmonic acid synthesis have been implicated in defense responses to in, in multiple crops. And it has a general role, particularly in defense against necrotrophic uh, and also insect pathogens. So that seems like an attractive pathway that might have something to do with plant defense. So Judy obtained two different 
tassel seed two mutants and uh, two different mut mutants assayed with two different reflections of disease. That how long it takes for a lesion to form, and she could, could see that the, the um, disease the lesions form quicker, and disease progresses stronger in both of those mutants. So she felt like Ching, she's got a QTL for disease there. But annoyingly, there's no QTL there. Like, what the heck, you know? So everything fell together except for that, you know, she's explaining a non-QTL. Uh, there is a days to anthesis of maturity gene there, and there's a southern corn leaf blade gene at that location. But anyway, so when she looked back at these individual subpopulations, so this is the, um, where her gene is, and that's where the association hit is. Um, so there's no joint linkage QTL there. But there is, you know, at least one of the subpopulations does have an implicated interval there. So maybe it's like the TEX-303 that if it's a rare, uh, if it's rare in the founders of the NAM, you won't see it as a NAM QTL. So a little bit more in support of that, Judy also did um, mapping using uh, recurrent selection materials. So um, there's a cool set of materials from CIMIT where, where an extremely diverse population of maize was subjected to several cycles of selection specifically for resistance to northern leaf blight. And it was really effective. It, you got 17% um, trait uh, shift per cycle. And so you go from really susceptible in so the cycle zero to really resistant in the, uh, the fourth cycle of selection. And there's a microsatellite marker closely linked to tassel seed 2 that did shift significantly in frequ allele frequency um, throughout this, sh this process. So that was imp 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 it was an implication that tassel seed 2 might, be, might have been selected. And then to clinch on that point, Judy developed a series of segregating populations from that recurrent selection material, a subset of which did show a trait, an NLB trait association with that tassel seed 2 late microsatellite marker. So she confirmed that yeah, it's under selection in the, in the recurrent selection material, and it is actually trait associated in derivatives of that material. So that's a pretty convincing case that there is, in the greater sense of maize germplasm, there is a QTL at this locus. Um, so, she, so if tassel seed two is involved, is it a general thing? Is it tassel seed two? How about tassel seed one, the gene that's the lipoxygenase that's actually involved in jasmonic acid synthesis? And that again is a bit of a cleaner story. She, the location of the gene corresponds to the, to a, nicely to a NAM joint linkage mapping QTL, and there are several of the subpopulations that have a QTL at that interval. Um, there's also um, a southern corn leaf blight uh, QTL at that location, and there is a maturity QTL in the same vicinity. Um, she does have preliminary evidence that there is a direct uh, northern leaf blight phenotype of the tassel seed one mutant. And um, so uh, the, you have a sh short, the, the mutants develop lesions sooner and have uh, more disease area under the disease progress curve. And she was able to further to show that when she treated the mutants with jasmonic acid, she was able to partially restore the uh, the wild type phenotype. So the, this is the mutants, this is the wild type, and by adding j jasmonic acid, not enough to actually cure the tassel seed phenotype, but it did, it did at least reduce the disease susceptibility. So I think she's got a good case going there that um, this gene has a role to play in defense. So she, we, we, we decided to explicitly add that to our list of hypotheses involved in hormone metabolism response. Okay, so now my last vignettes here around that biggest QTL on the map. So these are the famous, um, this, is, this location corresponds to where the, uh, the major genes for, uh, for this particular disease reside. So you've got two different major genes known to reside in this area, HT2 and HTN. Uh, they have quite different, uh, different phenotypes. Um, this is a sh HT2 has a shorter delay of disease and 15% effect in near isogenic lines. This is a, HTN has a two week delay in lesion formation and a 50% effect on disease. So the material that I'm gonna show you is actually, um, we, we pu pulled out uh, this locus from 
In this case, the material's derivative of, of DK888. So DK888 is a maize uh, variety, it's a hybrid from DeKalb that's uh, the, in the GEM program, the genetic enhancement of maize, DK888 was one of the lines that had shown multiple disease resistance. So we started pulling out resistance lo loci from DK888. And one of the ones we pulled out was at this eight, uh, 806 locus. So it's, it has quite a strong effect on disease, maps to, maps to 806. Um, it's, uh, when tested with those, those, those different uh, isolates representing different races, this particular locus shows race specificity. So it's um, conditions resistance to certain isolates and not to others. And Chao Lin Chung showed that this particular, uh, maybe with Tiffany, um, Chao Lin, uh, showed that this particular source of resistance, this, this, the resistance at this locus was allelic to HT2, or appeared to be so. So Chao Lin was able to fine map it down to a one centimorgan interval um, that uh, carries, uh, I think, 12, 12 genes. Um, so it's a really strong effect in uh, 12 genes on the B73 map. Now, to s I had initially uh, called these major genes like simple resistance, but when you go and you look at the actual eight, the, the, the locus associated with these simply inherited traits, it's ex extremely complex. So the claim that simple resistance is simple is totally not the case here. It's a really, the, the 806 locus is extremely complex. We have the HT2 and HTN fine mapping regions are, uh, are distinct. They don't look distinct in this picture, but they're, they are different intervals that they're extremely close together. Um, in the NAM joint linkage, you, we, we have two adjacent regions that are implicated. Um, these are actually distinct, although again, they don't look like it. Now when we inoculated all the NAM parents and we look at their, uh, their uh, composite interval maps, it's quite complex. We, I mean, I have, I really can't t tell you anything clear about what's going on at this locus at this point. But if you just look at these two, they're very different phenomena, what we know now about our HT2 and HTN sources. So Judy's been working on HT2 for some years and has shown a nice story about, um, sorry, sorry, HTN, excuse me. Um, the, she's shown that there's a modifier of HTN that's closely linked to HTN, and um, she's uh, fine mapped it down to a, quite a small interval there. So that, that story will be forthcoming. But so simpl even simplicity is wildly complex, and I think we've got a lot to learn about what's going on. By inoculating all these, we realize, yeah, we, we don't really fully understand what's happening at all. So in dealing with that complexity, uh, one way forward is actually to understand not only the defensive strategies in the maize plant, but also the offensive strategies in the pathogen Cetosferia tersica. So Chalin and now Jesse, uh, and, and then later Jesse Pollan and now Santiago Mideras are working on uh, fine mapping the uh, offensive genes in the pathogen. So Chalin made a map from Cetosferia tersica. They used genotyping, Jesse with, uh, did genotyping by sequencing for all the segregating fungal isolates, and now Santiago has um, fine mapped down the avirulence locus corresponding to HT2 um, to, to a relatively small part of the fungal genome. So I think um, we have seen from some other cases in the literature, including Adam Bogdanov, um, a new faculty member in plant pathology, that sometimes understanding what the pathogen is doing can be much more incisive sometimes than understanding what the plant is doing. Sometimes you get, you know, someone clones a QTL and they, you know, now you have some gene name, you have no idea what's going on. But by understanding the pathogen's offensive schemes, you can have a much better understanding of how the host pathogen interaction works. So that's one of the ways that we're gonna try to understand this particular locus. Um, so, okay, here we've, we started with um, biparental QTL maps. So this is historically recognized <laughs> as a really important defensive locus. Um, yeah, very clearly emerging from our synthetic efforts and also from the nested association mapping. We've fine mapped it down to a certain point, undertaken some pathogen genetics. It's race specific and, you know, we're trying to understand the allelism relationships here, which will probably be better done at the molecular level than genetically. So now, sort of wrapping up, we, I started with this series of hypotheses about hosts, hosts, uh, what, how plants can defend themselves um, in a quantitative manner against diverse um, pathogens. Um, we got a, 
when I look at uh, the various results from these various uh, zooms in, we have, we have different types of evidence to support all of those hypotheses, which is kind of what we would have expected. Um, now, we're not alone in seeing this, this, this um, complexity. There was a series of uh, major gene clonings for, for, quanti for quantitative resistance to pathogens that came out in pretty much in science in 2009. And so there are cases in which a QTL can be identified with a single gene, but the new generation of papers coming out about quantitative trait loci for def plant defense are, are implicating, in, in one case, um, copy number variation, where the QTL is attributable to how many repeats you have of multiple genes. And in, in other QTLs, they're finding the same thing that we're finding, that there could be multiple genes at a given locus that are all you know, together conditioning resistance. So clusters of unrelated genes that are implicated in the single trait. So I think there's a general trend here that you know, there is sometimes simplicity, but sometimes really underlying complexity under these loci. And now that we have um, an increasing sense of some of the pleiotropic interactions, hormones, maturity, actin complexes, plant height, I think we're going to need to go and see much more explicitly what are the yield effects of our QTL before we can really understand whether or not these are going to be of interest for practical uh, crop crop protection. This is Gary Bergstrom's um, picture of northern leaf blight in the field this year. And I think when you've got a bad enough problem, you're willing to deal with some trade-offs. So you've got to take that into account. How much good do you get from the locust? Anyway, and insofar as we do have uh, uh, tr trade-offs here, um, it won't be the first time. So um, I think we have a general issue of resistance being correlated with maturity. And at least for some major genes, there, don't, there doesn't necessarily seem to be a yield penalty. But there, there is um, significant evidence that, that defensive genes can come with yield penalties or other peculiarities. And that's the, um, uh, is this the LR34 where you have, yeah, where you have the disease phenotype is associated with some uh, effect on the flag leaf. So even in human cases, you have um, cases where disease resistance, be it for malaria or for smallpox, you get major human diseases that are the downside risk of resistance to pathogens. So if, you know, if the heterozygotes are less susceptible to, to uh, malaria for sickle cell, but the homozygotes have a problem, and Tay-Sachs is the same thing. You've got an advantage as a heterozygote and a horrible disadvantage in the homozygous state. So these are uh, not, not, un not unanticipated complexities. So just to wrap up, we started out with you know, a, a, some understanding of the complexity at the genetic level of this trait. We're starting to figure out how, the, um, how some of these genes map onto the, how some of the plant defense genes map onto the QTL map. And you know, we're, we're really looking forward to better understanding through uh, gene network analysis. Our, our N current NSF collaboration will allow us to, to dig into that issue. Um, we've, We've uh, taken, we've had great advantage of a diversity of genetic uh, resources here at Cornell, uh, particularly from the uh, Mays Diversity Project, and you know, getting into transgenic pathogen genetics and better, more allele mining and expression is, you know, gonna, I think, gonna help us have a deeper understanding of the, these complexities. So I want to thank um, a bunch of people. I think, particularly Tiffany and Judy. But we, you know, build, they're building on a considerable amount of work from Randy and Jesse as well, and, and uh, quite a few great undergrads. Uh, the Buckler Lab, um, and thanks lately to Peter and Dallas and Nick. They've been uh, wonderful colleagues. We always work in collaboration with Peter and Randy and Margaret as well. And I think I forgot some mutant collaborators that Judy told me to put up there, so sorry about that, <laughs> who are absent but much appreciated. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>